Welcome in to the Boys Collective episode number 11 here on 105 Through the Fan here on YouTube. My name is Kevin Gray alongside one-fourth of the G-Bag Nation and Super Bowl winning scout. Brian brought us on a Wednesday. Brian, good to see you. Hopefully uh, the weather is not treating you too bad. I know it's been a little gloomy over the last couple of days here. <laughs> no, man, had to go into the closet and uh, pull out some of the old school uh, LSU <laughs> gear that I used to have. But uh, yeah, no, everything's good. And uh, it's always good to be uh, talking Dallas Cowboys with you, KG. Yeah, as the Cowboys uh, continue their preparations for the Denver Broncos on Sunday, where they are a nine and a half point favorite. Uh, installed as a nine and a half point favorite going into Sunday. You can subscribe to 105 through the fan here on YouTube, and you can check out the boys collective on all of our social media platforms, including 105 through the fan.com. Just make sure you hit that notifications button. So, you know, when the episodes drop, uh, let's just jump right in uh, to the broadest files here on the boys collective episode number 11, a lot of news and notes for the Cowboys as we are into Wednesday as they continue to get ready for practice in today and also on Thursday in preparation for the Denver Broncos. Let's start uh, with some accolades and some awards, uh, namely Micah Parsons named NFC Defensive Player of the Week for your Dallas Cowboys. 11 tackles, four tackles for loss, just a missile all over the field on Sunday night against the Minnesota Vikings. And Brian, I want to get your thoughts on this because Ryan Clark of ESPN had a very interesting uh, note about the game itself that Micah Parsons did not have the green dot on his helmet, signaling him as the guy calling the plays and getting the defense aligned. Uh, that was J. Ron Curse actually right. on Sunday night who actually had the green dot. Your thoughts on that? And is that something that the Cowboys kind of planned on going into the week and maybe something that we'll have um, going forward now, especially the way that we saw Parsons play on Sunday night. Is that something that you anticipate the Cowboys continuing to do possibly? Yeah, Christy Scales uh, on the Cowboy uh, pregame show on 105.3 The Fan, uh, we go to her several times during the broadcast, and one of the final notes she had before the game started was that – you know, she always gives us the update who is going to wear the green dot. And that signifies, as you say, the communication for the, for the, the, the game. And, you know, and I always like to ask that question myself because when it comes to Micah Parsons, if Parsons doesn't have the green dot, then sometimes he tends to play a little bit more defensive end. So there's some kind of, you know, there's some rhyme and reason to what they do. But, you know, you, you talk about with what Curse has done, you know, this team is 6-0 and since he started on defense. I mean, you know, he, he's, he's played exceptionally well, um, you know, in these games. And, you know, the Tampa game, he got some involvement, and all of a sudden it's like Dan Quinn and the staff goes, oh, by the way, we need to maybe put Jaron Curse in the starting lineup and see what happens. And so, yeah, it doesn't surprise me one bit that, that he was the guy that was in charge because it was clear that Dan Quinn had a game plan and the staff had a game plan. They were, they felt like that they could hold up on the back end with, with both Diggs and Brown in coverage, Jordan Lewis, whoever played in the slot for him, Jordan Lewis was going to be fine. They felt that way. So that means curse and those guys can now play down and figure out how to deal with the run. You know, I mean, they did a really good job of matching up across the board but the whole idea of the green dot is that guy's not coming off the field. And that's mm -hmm. what they determined with curse. He just wasn't going to come off the field. They had, you know, whether it's play the run, defend the pass, they had a really good idea of what they needed to do. And so, you know, that's, uh, that just goes back once again to Dan Quinn and the staff for their ability to take players. We always hear the lip. The, it's always like a lip service. You know, they say, Oh, we got to put our players in position to make plays. This staff does that, and that's one of the th reasons why I think they're having so much success is because they're playing to the strengths of their players and not asking them to do things that they're not capable of doing. Curse with the green dot makes perfect sense to me. And Micah Parsons was the, was the beneficiary of it because yeah. he was all over the field. It felt like he played fast, play, played like a guy who didn't have to do a lot of thinking, just reading, reacting and making plays on the ball. And it felt like, to me, 
his best game as a pro, especially at the linebacker spot. We've seen him do some different things throughout the season in terms of rushing the passer, but I thought for his linebacker play, just stellar in what he did against yeah. the Vikings. I think I think you're absolutely right, KG, and I'll tell you why I think that's the case. The Vikings are not a team that is going to give you a lot of movement and eye candy stuff. You know, they're not they're going to get in basically certain formations and they're just going to sit there and they're going to and so what happens is either Cousins is going to try and get the ball to you know one of those receivers or they're going to run the ball downhill at you. I mean, it's a perfect game for Micah Parsons. I mean, it wasn't like oh, Micah Parsons has got to match up. Yeah, they have a back that can catch the football, but they had that covered. They had that taken care of. It wasn't like they were trying to do a lot of things on the perimeter with that running back throwing the football. It was screens and things that Micah, you know, if you watch him play, I mean, he was reading it so fast. Mm -hmm. He was reading it faster than Van Der Esch, and Van Der Esch can usually read things pretty quickly. I mean, he was like pushing Van Der Esch out of the way to get to the ball. I mean, that that's the kind of, you know, I mean, he knew after that New England game that he had had some struggles and he vowed not to play that way. But I think the Vikings offense really lends to like a linebacker being able to hone in on his assignments, play downhill and make plays. It sounds like based on how you're describing it, maybe there isn't all that much creativity on the Vikings offense with respect to how they utilize Kirk Cousins, given the fact that at times uh, he can be a little inaccurate with the football, but when he is on schedule, right. he can you know play pretty well. So Michael Parsons, NFC Defensive Player of the Week for the Dallas Cowboys, second player this year to give be given such an honor. Of course, Trayvon Diggs has already won an NFC Defensive Player of the Week and NFC Defensive Player of the Month uh, right. earlier this year. So these Cowboys defensively continuing to play well, uh, switching things to the offensive side. Um, Tyron Smith, it's starting to look like and appear based on what we've seen and heard so far uh, that he will not be looks like going on Sunday against the, right. uh, the Denver Broncos. Michael Gelkin of the uh, Dallas Morning News tweeting out today that uh, Mike McCarthy said during his media availability, uh, quote unquote, will not work today. Uh, Mike McCarthy told the media when it comes to uh, Tyron Smith and that quote, he would be pressed to play this week against yeah. the Denver Broncos. So it sounds like um, a guy who's, and we've heard dealing with a bone spur, potentially bone spurs in that ankle. Uh, yeah. It could be a little bit more significant than what, you know, has yeah. been let on so far. Well, KG, I'm going to, I'm going to help you out here. I, I've talked to some people over there mm -hmm. about that. And Dr. Jerry talked about bone spurs. The bone spurs are in a different part of his body that they're dealing with there. What he's dealing with right now is a recurring high ankle sprain. And mm -hmm. What I was told is this, it just needs rest. If there's, it's kind of complicated, but really the, the most simple way to explain it is that it is a high ankle sprain and he's playing, he's trying to play through it and he can't. So really not involved with the bone spur stuff, more of the high ankle, more of like when he plays, you know, I was told it's about rest. And so here's the first week of rest. You know, this is, now it's about figuring out how to use Ty and Sicky, how to use Lyle Collins. I don't think they want to move Steele from right tackle to left tackle. I just don't think they want to do that. Steele's looking comfortable playing that, uh, you know, even though he did play some left tackle in the preseason, I kind of feel like that they just want him to play on that right side. And let's see what happens with Sicky. Let's see what happens with Collins. You know, one of those guys will likely get the start over there. My gut feeling is initially it's going to be in Siki in the first team with the, you know, getting those reps. But I guarantee you there's going to be some push from the from the front office about let's see what we have in Lyle Collins here. Let's see, you know, I mean, Ty and Siki, the early part of that game that he had to play, played way too high. They allowed defenders to get underneath him, drive him back. Tackles are responsible for the width of the pocket. The guards and centers are responsible for the depth of the pocket. So if you're always getting squeezed and then pushed, quarterbacks are going to have problems. Dak Prescott can generally handle things in front of him. Mm -hmm. It's the it's it, excuse me. He can generally handle things on the edge. He can feel and see the edge. It's the middle stuff that's going to give him problems. So yeah, they need to make sure though that at least the width of the pocket on that on that left side is taken care of. And Ty Siki had his problems 
played better uh, in the second half when he had to. But I, I guarantee you, Jerry Jones is talking right now about how do we get Lyle Collins more involved. We just can't have a potential like uh, before the season or maybe an uh, all-pro all type of a player sitting out and watching, uh, watching, these, uh, watching these games. McCarthy further telling the media that, quote, we'd rather Denver find out when they find out when respect yeah. to whom will work at the left tackle spot, whether it be Ty and Seki, Terrence Steele, uh, or Leo Collins. So Mike McCarthy trying to keep it close to the vest when it comes to yeah. who's going to be taking the reps at left tackle. Well, there's really no secrets here, KG. There's yeah, really but- no <laughs> secrets. You know, yeah. there's no secrets here. They, they've got two guys to get ready. And whoever they determine, and Lyle Collins has not played left tackle since his days at LSU. I mean, that's when you watched him play, when you watched him evaluate him, he was a left tackle at LSU. He was a good left tackle. But he went from left guard to right tackle, you know, and I just don't see them moving two spots. I just don't see them saying, okay, we're going to put a guy in here. Now we're going to move another guy over. I just, even though that Lyle Collins is a right tackle, moving, you know, I mean, that would say a lot about Terrence Steele if they moved him from right tackle to left tackle. And I mean, he played very well in the game the other day, Mm -hmm. but maybe that left tackle, now he's gotten a little rhythm about playing the right side and kind of feeling comfortable. And, and, and Zach Martin can help him over there. You know, Zach Martin can definitely help him over there because, you know, he's going to need help every once in a while. He flips the other side. Connor Williams has had his own struggle playing left guard. Right. So why do you want to put two maybe potentially struggling positions together on that left side on the blind side of Dak Prescott? Just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I could see Lyle Collins getting a lot of work this week. I sure could. The football gods also smiling on the Dallas Cowboys as they take on the Denver Broncos. I know Von Miller. Von Miller, right. of course, traded to the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Will not be seeing the Dallas Cowboys uh, this week. So the football guys still looking on the Cowboys rather well. Other news for the Cowboys. Uh, Blake Jarvin won't practice uh, as we're recording this on Wednesday. He's dealing with a hip injury. The Cowboys also made some procedural moves putting Jabril Cox on the injured reserve, dealing with a torn ACL, and also releasing uh, former Utah Ute uh, Bradley and I. Now, they are hoping, McCarthy is saying, to hopefully get him back uh, onto the practice squad. Do you think that's a fit for him for this team still, based on the amount of guys that are starting to come back and will come back and the depth that they have you know, on, this, on this defensive line at this point? Yeah, we talked about this uh, on 105.3 The Fan yesterday, Gavin and Jeff and Lucius and myself, and we talked about the potential like, okay, why would you not go make a deal for a defense then? Would you do the Von Miller deal if it wasn't, in fact, one of those things where it was a two and a three? You know, and Jerry talks about, well, we don't want to bring in a progress stopper and all that. Me personally, as a, as a personnel guy, I think I could find a Bradley and I. I'm not worrying about Bradley and I. They just showed you really, yes, they like Bradley and not. Yes, they want to bring him back to the practice squad. But yes, if they would have made a trade for a defensive end, Bradley and I likely was the guy that was going to be released. So that just shows you that's not a progress stopper. That's, you know, that's it's what it is. It's you, sure. you manipulate your roster. You do what you have to do. If they get Bradley and I back, good for him. You know, that's good for him to be on the practice squad. Good for the Cowboys to have some depth at that position. But, you know, I, I kind of feel like, though, that now it's about they've got guys that are designated for return. Michael Gallup's designated for return. They're going to need a roster spot there. Uh, Francis Bernard, a linebacker. Now that, that Cox is out of the picture, they're going to need linebacker help. Francis Bernard makes a lot of sense right there uh, for that. So a couple of those spots, you know, they've talked about with Hamilton, the defensive tackle who they've been yo-yoing up and down from practice squad to active roster every week, they got to put him on the active roster too. Three spots right there. I think it's, you know, we can wait and see what happens with Tristan Hill, you know, but they're going to need the linebacker. They, they're going to the, – the receiver's kind of an interesting one right now, but I, I think they want to get Michael Gallup going back as quickly as possible. So Hamilton, Bernard, Gallup. Those would be the three, I think, that use those roster spots that we're talking about right now. Speaking of Michael Gallup, also from McCarthy's availability, quote, I, yeah, I hope so. We'll see. We'd like to see another week's work. Uh, we're really trusting the rehab process and timelines of what's ideal 
And what's a little early could be another week potentially for Michael Gallup as he works his way back from his calf yeah. injury. Okay, if it turns into another week there with Michael Gallup, I was told that it might be this week that him coming back. Because I, I asked last week, is it another week for Gallup? And I was getting the indication it was just going to be one more week. We'll see. But let's see if they work him out. They might carry this thing another week. Then again, you might have two of the – maybe maybe this is a Tristan Hill off P, uh, PUP. You know, you know it, it's about – they're going to need one of those spots. Like I say, Hamilton makes a lot of sense. They can't lose Hamilton. That's that's just not – he's playing too well for him them as a rotational player. They need to get him up on the roster so nobody tries to come and take a guy like that. It might protect him and all that stuff, but he's going to have to go onto the active roster. It's just – and then the linebacker stop. You've got to find another – you've got to have another linebacker. Bernard makes a lot of sense there. So let, let's see what happens at wide receiver, but I kind of feel like that it's more like getting Gallup back if they can. This is that time of the year where teams are banged up. A lot of folks, you know, in and off the injury reports, trying to get guys back as they get ready for the second half, you know, of the season, theoretically. And the Cowboys are no different uh, as they deal with their own personnel issues. One of something I wanted to touch on real quick here on the Boys Collective, and we've seen this start to kind of, you know, permeate itself throughout the league. Uh, the New York Giants, 13 individuals testing positive for COVID, including running back Saquon Barkley. Aaron Rodgers is going to miss this week's game against the Kansas City Chiefs because he tested positive for COVID-19. Now, what's interesting about his situation, he is not vaccinated either. Right. So the earliest that he could return is November the 13th. So right. he will miss at least this week's game um, against the Kansas City Chiefs. And it's something that obviously all 32 NFL teams are aware of and obviously trying to take precautions in taking care of of these things. The Cowboys are no different from what you understand and how this team moves about. Is this something that will be and continuously be a conversation about, Hey guys, look, be more aware. This is kind of starting to happen around the league. Let's make sure we're taking care of ourselves, especially for a team that we, for what we understand is mostly, uh, if not all completely vaccinated at this point. Yeah. I think KG, the, you know, I'm very critical of Mike McCarthy and people get on me about that. And, but I will give Mike McCarthy credit for a couple of things. I'll give him credit for taking care of his team health wise, whether it's shortening practice, whether it's uh, understanding that hurt guys, a lot of coaches will try and push hurt guys to play. And, you know, the, I, the medical staff over there, they don't want to put hurt players out on the field. Sure. They really don't. Mike McCarthy understands this. He understands there's a difference between the pain and injury and stuff like that. And, and I think the staff over there really appreciates that as far as going forward. I think another thing is Mike McCarthy's pandemic plan when it came to, or the team's plan when it came to how to keep their team mostly healthy during those unknown times last year, the space that you have at the star, the, the meeting rooms, the, to being able to separate guys. Okay, we're going to go into the star. We're going to have our meetings. You're sitting six feet apart. I mean, there's ways to create an environment where these players are not just, you know, there's places I've been in my life and, and, and working for organizations where meeting rooms were cramped. You didn't have the space that they have there out there in Frisco at the star. They're able to separate people. The, uh, Jim Maurer, Britt Brown, all those people over there, I mean, they're able to contact trace. They're able to have all that stuff available. And I think they're going to continue to do that. You do not want to be a team that has your season ruined because mm -hmm. of COVID, but you don't know. I mean, you could be vaccinated and get COVID, but if you can at least prevent, and I think the Cowboys had a really good plan for that last year. And now it's about, okay, well, let's be diligent. Let's continue. And it's on the players though, too, KG. Sure. It's on the players to know when you leave that building, where are you going? Are you going home? Are you going to clubs? Are you going? I mean, after what we saw with the Henry Rugg situation, if that's not an eye opening thing right now, uh, DeMonte KZ, his eyes had to be wide open after what happened with him with that arrest. And stuff. I mean, he yeah. has to think, holy geez, that could have been me kind of a thing. And I think those are the kinds of things that get your attention. But the overall, to yeah, I think they had a good plan. I think they can they can continue to keep their team separated. But man, it is on the players. This COVID doesn't just 
uh, it doesn't discriminate. It can get anybody vaccinated or not. But if you can do some things to kind of help yourself along, then maybe they can get through the season not having to deal with it. You know, they've had to deal with it a little bit. But, man, like you said, the Giants, now the Packers, there's a lot of things going on with these teams. It's something to definitely watch for and to continue to have that heightened awareness as these teams go through this season and that COVID is still out there. It's still, yeah. unfortunately, uh, wreaking havoc on a lot of individuals. And for the NFL, they are no different. The Cowboys taking those precautions moving forward from there. Uh, moving on from that, I want to get your take on this because – now this team is 6-1 and one on the season. They've won six straight games. They're installed as a heavy favorite against the Denver Broncos on Sunday. We're anticipating as the week goes on, hopefully that Dak Prescott is getting to a place where he's going to be ready to go uh, to mm -hmm. play against the Denver Broncos. From your vantage point, though, Brian, why is this team or the biggest reason for this team being 6-1 and one where they are right now given the amount of things that they've gone through from an adversity perspective, whether it be injury, whether it be, you know, winning games on the road, what in your mind is the biggest reason why this team is playing the kind of football the way that they are to see them six and one right now? Yeah. I mean, I, I do believe that, you know, this might go back a little bit to, it's going to sound crazy to say this, but you go back to a little bit, maybe the Jason Garrett administration and maybe some of your core players, were the right kind of guys. Maybe they were the maybe they were the right kind of guys that were brought in that that care about the operation, care about what they need to do, that are, that play hard, they prepare. You know, you look at like a guy like Ezekiel Elliott, and he had an awful season last year, and he knew it. What did he go do? He redid his body, he remade himself. He said, "Listen, I am not going to go through what I went through last year." You know, you start to you get a, a Dak Prescott back. You know, through through a a terrible injury, his, his drive, his determination, you know, it, it, it's just incredible that he, you know, and then he gets hurt in training camp and you could just feel that, gosh, I did everything I could to get back. Well, I'll get back again. I just do think they have the right kind of players, but I also give this coaching staff a lot of credit. I will give Mike McCarthy credit, uh, you know, for, you know, allowing guys like Dan Quinn and Joe Witt, and Joe Philbin and and uh, George Edwards and Skip Pete. I, he lets these guys coach. You know, I mean, he he. You know, we talk about the, about the walk around coach and stuff, but he's got a really good staff. Last year, he didn't have a good staff, especially on defense. He fired all those coaches. I've mentioned that a thousand times, but it, they got the right staff now. They got the right kind of player that is determined to play. You get a guy like Dan Quinn in there. He gives him a different perspective because he remade himself as well. Mm -hmm. You got the growth of Kellen Moore as an offensive play caller. You know, now he's like, oh, okay, well, this is what I can do. And he's a more confident play caller. So you're benefiting from the growth of a young offensive coordinator. You're taking advantage of a defensive coordinator that had to go find himself. You know, it was probably a, it was probably a shot in the gut to get <laughs> fired. If Dan Quinn yeah. would have played one half of football on defense like he's playing right now, he'd probably still be in Atlanta as a head coach. But that's a big shot in the gut to lose that game and never know if you're going to get back again. And then to have the, the presence of mind to say, I have got to remake myself. And I think that's a I think that's a remarkable thing. You've got guys that have have remade themselves. You know, look at, look at, for example, look at Terrence Steele. <laughs> the guy has remade himself, whether it's good or bad. We didn't trust. Okay. I shouldn't say you, I didn't trust Terrence Steele playing right tackle. Oh, I didn't, I didn't. either. I didn't, I didn't. either. <laughs> so but he went out there and he remade himself. You know, is it pretty all the time? No, it's not. You know, but you had guys that after last season sat down and said, I have got to do something different. And I think it's the collective group of those guys saying that that's got this team to where they are right now at six and one. And it's interesting. You talked about McCarthy and kind of letting his coaches coach. And to me, that's one of the biggest reasons why I feel like this team is six and one. Right. We could criticize, you know, McCarthy for the clock management stuff and some of the decisions that he's made at times that have put this team in peril that they've still been able to overcome. But to me, his biggest credit this year is just getting out of the way. You mentioned a better staff that allows 
these players to trust in what they are selling because what was the report last year from NFL Network's Jane Slater, especially on the defensive right. side, that yeah. these players did not trust what these coaches were selling to them and did not believe that they would be put in the best position to go out and play well every single Sunday. So now that the confidence has been restored in these coaches with a better staff, I think these players feel much better about the plans that they are able to execute week over week. And you give McCarthy credit for recognizing, hey, this ain't it when it comes to Mike Nolan and this defensive staff, but also continuing to allow Keller Moore to grow and become a better coordinator week over week to the point where it felt like, especially in the game against the Vikings on Sunday night, and I tweeted it out you know, on my timeline that Keller Moore earned himself a head coaching job. You helped that quarterback yeah. on the road in his first start throw for 325, win a big road game. If he is, you know, on the staff next year, that would be fantastic. But to me, I am not going to be surprised now at this point if an NFL team looks at especially that performance and say, hey, that dude right there could lead an NFL team. But I wonder if he has, I guess, that quote unquote makeup, whatever that is for a particular team to look at him and say, hey, this is going to be the leader of 53 men every single Sunday out here yeah. for us. I, I'll, I'll take it a step further, KG. And I think you're absolutely right. I think he earned the head coaching job of putting 500 and whatever yards on Bill Belichick's <laughs> defense. Yes. I think, yeah. I think that's where, I think that's where people stood up and took notice. The fact that Bill Belichick gave up his defense, gave up that many yards. I think that was the, I think that was the kicker for Kellen Moore. Uh, I'll say this about Kellen Moore's demeanor. He reminds me very much of a Tony Dungy. When you look at what that type of coach, uh, maybe a guy that's not a yeller screamer, you know, maybe a guy that's not going to get in your face and be all combative and all that. I see a very calm demeanor. I see a guy that's having fun. I see a guy that has interaction with his players. I see a guy that has the trust of his players. It reminds me very much of Tony Dungy. You know, Tony Dungy, wherever Tony Dungy went, he had the respect of his team. He had the respect of his players. Because they didn't feel like that he was that he was beating them up, whether that was physically, mentally, whatever. I could see I could see Kellen Moore having that type of demeanor and then going off into and players play hard for him because they know that he's been a player. They know that he's had some success. And the fact that again, these general managers and, and owners, I think they're looking for offensive-minded coaches. I mean, I'm, I, I know the I think the NF, uh, the AFC East is the one division that has all these defensive coaches, whether it's Robert Sala with the Jets, you know, a guy at Miami, you know, Buffalo has a defensive coach. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, these general managers, usually when a team's pretty bad, say like now maybe the Chicago Bears, if they change out the general manager, the head coach, you know, I don't know if they're looking for a defensive coach. They've got a young quarterback. A lot of these programs have young quarterbacks. And Jacksonville, let's just use them as an example, too. If Urban Meyer decides, I don't want to be in the NFL anymore, there's Jacksonville. They've got a decent roster. They've got a young quarterback that needs development. If I'm Trent Balky, the GM down there, I'm interviewing offensive coaches. My livelihood depends on Trevor Lawrence being a better player. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think a guy like Kellen Moore has a big opportunity because these guys are going to be looking for offensive-minded coaches. The last thing I'll say on this, too, is that when you look at them at six and one now, their ability, it feels like this team trusts and believes in the man next to them. I thought J. Ron Curse had a really interesting quote after the game saying, you know, this team, regardless of side of the ball, is extremely tight. And yeah. you can see that the way that they react to each other when they play well or do things for one another. Mm -hmm. It feels like a team that feels very together. And I don't know if that's cliche or not, or if that's something that's very real for them in that locker room. But if it is, I think it plays itself out week over week. And you say, Kevin, that's easy to say when they're winning football games, we'll see as the season goes on, when they continue to deal with the adversity that hits every football team at different points of the season, how they handled it. But at least on the surface, it feels like a team that very much is playing for one another. And I think they that's are. huge when you're trying to accomplish this, something as big as trying to win or go deep into the playoffs and potentially win, you know, a championship. So We'll see if they can keep it going. <laughs> the Cowboys, 6-1. and one, They take on the Denver Broncos on Sunday uh, afternoon. And uh, looking forward to our Friday show here on the Boys right. Collective. 
That's going to be our Cowboys Broncos preview show. Before we get out of here, anything you want to tease for us that you are seeing for the Cowboys potentially having success on Sunday against the yeah, Broncos? Yeah, I, I watched the Broncos last night. I think this will be an interesting matchup for, uh, again, Novon Miller, but there's some defensive players you have to worry about on that team, uh, especially in the middle of their defensive line. And I think there's some, I think there's a, a couple of offensive guys you need to kind of keep an eye on as well that could potentially cause you some issues as well. And by the way, this is a team that blocks field goals. They've blocked three of them already. Mm. The two games I've watched, uh, two against the football team and then one against the Cleveland Browns. So if you're worried about your bones <laughs> fossil and you're worried about your field goal kicking, you know, we've had some problems kicking field goals. Uh huh. You don't have your block unit up to up to snuff. Uh, this could be an interesting matchup because the Broncos find ways to block field goals. I hope I'm not saying something that will it, it <laughs> rear its ugly head and cost you a game, but it's something I sure watched on tape this uh, last night. Very interesting. Looking forward to that on uh, on Friday. Also, Patrick Sertan is going to be uh, on the opposite good side. Uh, good really player. good player who who me and a lot of thought Cowboys fans thought, hey, he was going to be having a star on the side of his helmet. I'll but hey, it, it worked out, though. We got Parsons. It worked out. It worked out. So I'm not going to complain too much. Diggs and Parsons would Diggs and, and Sertan would have been oh, a really man. Good oh, that would have yeah. been so much fun. Not going to lie to you. You can find us on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. You can find Brian on Twitter at Brian Broaddus. We will be back on Friday for our Cowboys Broncos preview as the Cowboys look to move to seven and one. And we'll get you your full pregame or your full game coverage uh, right here on the Boys Collective for the Super Bowl winning scout and one fourth of the G Bag Nation. Brian Broaddus. My name is Kevin Gray. We'll talk to you on Friday here on the Boys Collective to get you ready for the Cowboys taking on the Broncos. Brian, look forward to it on Friday. We'll talk to you then. See you then, KG. Sounds good.